Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have arrived at Maundy Thursday, the beginning of the best four days in the life of the church on earth. An annual remembrance of the life of Jesus in these final days. Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil, and Easter Sunday. I wasn't always a fan of these four days. In fact, growing up, it didn't mean a whole lot to me. I went to church occasionally. It was not who I was. It was just something we did from time to time. It wasn't until I moved to Texas for my first full-time ministry position that I fell in love with these four days. It was there in a living, breathing community of God's people that I found the depth of these four days. And at the risk of getting ahead of ourselves, my favorite memory of the four days always came during the Good Friday service, the service of Tenebrae, the darkening church working towards complete darkness. And as the church got fully dark, the lead pastor, Pastor Mel, would come over to the altar, dressed all in black, a shadow in the darkness, illumined by just the flickering flame of the Christ candle. And in his deep, rich, somewhat haunting voice, he would ask the congregation a question. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there? It was a good question. I mean, I wasn't there. And yet, in one way, I was kind of there. I invite you this evening to step into our story in a new way, to be fully present, a 13th disciple, if you will, as we experience together the events of this evening. It's the Passover day, a Thursday as we reckon it. And we watch as a few of the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him the question, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He says to go into the city and find a certain man and there a room will be prepared. And so they go, they do as Jesus said, and they begin to prepare. The Passover lamb is killed and roasted. The bread is baked. The table is set. The wine is poured. And all is ready for the supper. We can feel the buzz in the air, though. This isn't the normal Passover that they would celebrate. After all, who could forget just four days ago when Jesus came riding into the city on a donkey to crowds waving palm branches and hosannas echoing through the streets of Jerusalem. It was an electric feeling, like we are on the cusp of something amazing happening. This was not an ordinary Passover meal. And yet it begins as every Passover meal does. 
We go through the ritual of the ceremony. We remember our captivity in Egypt when we lived as slaves. And we remember the mighty works of the Lord in freeing us from that captivity. How we painted the blood of that sacrificial Passover lamb on the doorposts and door frames of our houses. And the angel of death passed over our houses. We might even still hear in our minds the wails of the Egyptians who lost their firstborn echoing down through history. We remember what God has done in His deliverance, but then the dinner takes an unexpected turn as Jesus breaks the script. And He says, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray Me. And we get this pit in our stomach. Does he know? He can't know. Surely he doesn't know. And we look around and one by one, the disciples come and they ask Jesus, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? The thought of someone here betraying Jesus is almost too much to bear, but even worse than that is the consequence of that betrayal. As Jesus says that, woe to that man whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man to have never been born. Harsh words. But then Judas, who would betray him, answers, Is it I, Rabbi? And Jesus says to him, You have said so. He doesn't know. Except we know. We have betrayed Jesus so many times. We betray Him when we fail to acknowledge our relationship with Him. We're we're worried what others might think. What would they say if they knew that I came to church on a regular basis, I prayed and I read my Bible, or even worse, what would they say? What would they think if they knew I believed that stuff? That there is an absolute right and wrong, and I don't get to decide which is which. That we are sinful people and need a Savior. That we aren't, on, we aren't able to save ourselves no matter how many bootstraps we pull. We'll never climb out of this pit What if they knew I believed that Jesus really is the only way? That all other religions are false gods? What would they say? What would they think of me? And so we hide our relationship. We keep it surface level and betray Jesus. This was not the Passover meal the disciples had prepared for. This is not the meal we had prepared for. The lamb killed and roasted, the bread baked, the table set, the wine poured. But then, catastrophe, a sudden disastrous end to this Passover meal. Our English word catastrophe is derived from a Greek word catastrophe and Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, took that Greek word and affixed the Greek prefix for good onto the front to coin a new word, 
a you catastrophe. And this is what he said about a you catastrophe. In essence, a you catastrophe is a massive turn in fortune from a seemingly unconquerable situation to an unforeseen victory, usually brought by grace rather than heroic effort. Such a turn is catastrophic in the sense of its breadth and surprise, and positive in that a great evil or misfortune is averted. God is turning our man-made catastrophes into a you catastrophe. He takes our catastrophe and he turns it into a you catastrophe. Because before the words of law are spoken, come words of gospel, just, at what, just as it was in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and a serpent that we know to be Satan. And the serpent deceived Adam and Eve so that they disobeyed God. And God came and spoke a catastrophic word of law to Adam and Eve. To Eve, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. To Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. As we began our Lenten journey some 40 days ago, a catastrophic word of law but preceded by a you catastrophic word of gospel. As God condemns the serpent, he says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. A you catastrophic word of gospel hope that a Savior one day would come to defeat Satan. And so it is in our story, in this Passover meal, before the word of law, beware the one who betrays. It'd be better if he had not been born. Comes a word of gospel. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Eleven simple words, and yet so powerful. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. He goes in fulfillment of all the scriptures, all the prophecies that had been spoken of him. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. In places like Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, he has put him to grief. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And then a you catastrophic word of gospel. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. It was not the Passover 
we had prepared for. It was not the Passover the disciples had prepared for. It had a catastrophic conclusion. But it was the Passover that we prepared for. Because it was our sin that prepared this sacrificial lamb, Jesus. We were there. We did betray. It was our shouts of crucify, crucify. Our mocking, our beating, our sin that had prepared this Passover lamb. But it was also a you catastrophic dinner. As Jesus gives a new meaning to this meal, a new gift for the church, a meal that we don't celebrate annually, but regularly in worship, a meal in which we remember our oppression, our time as slaves in Egypt, slaves to sin and death and the devil. But we do not only remember, we celebrate the mighty works of the Lord, because in this meal, the bread is truly his body, and the wine truly his blood, poured out just as Isaiah foretold for the sins of the world, to usher in a new covenant. He has worked a new catastrophe, bringing the sudden disastrous end to our enemy, to sin, death, and the devil. One of you will betray me. And the question, is it I, Lord, stings because we know we were there. We know the answer is, it is I, Lord. It is we, Lord. And that causes me to tremble. Who will save us from this body of death, this catastrophe? Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ says, it is I, the Lord. I will free you from this catastrophe. And I will turn it into a you catastrophe. And when you see that blood on that wood, you will know that death has been defeated, that your sins are paid for, that it is finished. And in the meantime, we wait and we gather regularly to enjoy this special meal as we wait for that day when Christ returns and the great resurrection where death is truly no more. And we celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb together with all who have gone before us in the faith with Jesus at the head. A you catastrophe. In Jesus' name, amen.